welcome to Channels Business Globe with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. Coming up on today's show, over 1,000 arrests have been made across the UK in connection with widespread riots sparked by misinformation following the tragic killing of three young girls in Southport. As the government grapples with the fallout, observers warn that underlying tensions could lead to further unrest. Our Downing Street correspondent Simon Pusey will soon be joining me here in the studio with the latest. And have your Dominic Odunuga, the CEO of Bridge and Value France, will be joining me from Paris for a deep dive into Nigeria's performance at the recently concluded Olympics, with a focus on how sports performance can elevate the nation's global brand and the role of corporate sponsorship in preparation for the Games. Then later, I'll be catching up with digital marketing expert and tech community leader Peace Itimi to explore the strategies driving success for African tech startups from scaling in unique markets to leveraging data-driven marketing. But first, British authorities have arrested over 1,000 individuals in connection with widespread riots across the UK, which erupted following the tragic killing of three young girls in Southport. The violence, initially sparked by misinformation that falsely linked the crime to a migrant, has fueled a surge in anti-immigrant sentiment, leading to significant unrest. Public sentiment captured on social media reveals a divided nation. While some posts commend the government for the mass arrests and efforts to restore order, others express deep frustration with the broader issues of immigration and government policies that many believe are at the heart of the situation. There are also concerns that the riots may not be over as tensions remain high across Britain. The crisis marks a critical test for Prime Minister Sir Keir Starmer as he seeks to navigate the complex and volatile landscape of public sentiment, misinformation and national security. Well, for more on this, I was earlier joined in the studio by our Downing Street correspondent, Simon Pusey. Simon, when we last spoke, I think that widespread violence had just started following the death, of course, of those three young girls in Southport. So much has happened in the middle. Uh, but since then, I think those are thousands, there's been over a thousand arrests, which has seemed to have simmered the, the, the violence somewhat. But there are so many layers to this, including the plague of knife crime, illegal migration, the rise in anti-right well, in far-right sentiment. Can you talk to me about what's happened in between? Yeah, I think it's also important to sort of put in context or just to keep clear that sometimes these things sort of flare up and there isn't an obvious kind of cause. Or yeah. we remember 2011 riots yeah. was caused by the death of one person in um, that most people wouldn't be able to name. Mm -hmm. um, and five, six people died during those riots. There was weeks of rioting across yeah. the country. Sometimes things do spark up and there isn't a particular, if you look back to 2011, you can't think of one thing that yeah. was wrong then. Yeah. So I think it's important to also take into account the weather. The police were always hoping that it was going to rain because people just wouldn't yeah. come out when... And it's a good point. In was... Britain, that's a really important point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then when um, uh, sort of counter-protesters came out in force, um, it all seemed to sort of die down, and but yeah. it could just spark up again. Um, it's also important to say that the government have been quick to push for prosecutions and very fast prosecutions. 24-hour so courts. So to try and get the, the media narrative in their favour, as opposed to yeah. um, people like Tommy Robinson and other people Andrew on the far Chai. right um, retweeting misinformation, yeah. they've used that in their own favour to yeah. try and get the news out to say we will punish you. And there have been some quite long sentences. A 15-year-old boy today um, is, is among lots being sentenced to day, um, a 53-year-old woman has been jailed for 15 months for a Facebook message for trying to incite things on Facebook. So There's so much to this because Sakir is not popular online. When you start online, hearing this. these kind of things, mm. if you are thinking of going to some of these riots, you'd definitely think again, wouldn't you? Yeah, if you, you know, someone being um, uh, has been jailed for three years for, for running into a hotel that was uh, housing migrants. So yes, at least 354 people have been charged so far, uh, with some facing multiple charges. Um, and this has all happened incredibly, incredibly fast. And I think that is important. There's other things too, actually, that are quite sort of docile and, and menial, but like the Olympics, you know, the Olympics has been on and maybe these protesters weren't necessarily busy watching the Olympics, but things just change. The mood changes a little bit. England, yes. Team GB win a few golds and suddenly people are sort of feeling a little bit better. I think there's a, a combination of that, the sentencing, um, and the government has come under criticism for not acting uh, sooner, uh, fast enough. Or recalling yeah. Parliament, which they did back in 2011. <laughs> exactly. They didn't do that. Um, I think you've got to get a balance, haven't you? You don't want to um, you know, spark fear unnecessarily. You want to be measured with it. 
Um, Has he been measured, Sakir? He is facing lots of criticism. I think Elon Musk is his biggest critic at the moment. Well, Elon Musk is, yeah, that's very interesting, isn't it? Coming out and and saying that there's two-tier policing. Two-tier care. But I think, uh, you know, look, there was a stabbing in Leicester Square uh, the other day. Um, a girl and a woman stabbed and a Muslim security man stepped in. There's not riots to, you know, it's, you've got to take this in proportion. Absolutely. And I think um, probably Elon Musk is really helping things. Um, I don't think so. Uh, at the moment. But, um, and then you've got, remember the, the difficult job the police have, you know, they're saying, lots of people are saying that they're not being harsh enough um, with, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, violent extremist Muslims. Um, and they're being too harsh on these protesters. But with, today we've just seen that police are sending um, a file of evidence to the Crown Prosecution Service following that horrendous incident that we saw at Manchester Airport where three officers were injured and a man was kicked on the floor. I don't know if you remember a couple of weeks ago. It just is very hard if you're the police, isn't it, to get that right level it of is policing, right. Um, especially when things um, get out of control like we saw over the last few weeks. And I think alcohol does play a part. I think the weather does play a part, um, people sort of coming together. But I'd... And racism. Come on, let's call a spade and, yeah, a spade, course, racism, Simon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think... Um, but I think the government will have to be faster if this happens again, because you need to get that media narrative out fast so yeah. that it doesn't sort of grow into something and spiral. But what about what about the we talk about the symptoms? What about the causes? What about um, the uh, the fact that knife crime is a scourge to the society and, of course, illegal migration? Numbers have been up. The weather's been good. Yeah, I mean, migration is is up massively, but there's so many different causes for that. Yes, um, and we've seen migration up across Europe um, on record levels. Yeah. It's not just a UK-based thing. Yes. Um, so th- I think the government needs to appear at least that they are cracking down on things like the small broke crossings and on knife crime. London has always been, you know, for the last decade or so, has been a hotbed of knife crime. Yes. So I think the appearance of having to get that under control is important for the government to look like they are making progress on those two issues. But it's very, very hard because it is a global problem, the the migration one. Um, And it's not just... um, places in the Middle East, you've got Ukraine, you've got Hong Kong, we've seen record levels of migration for those reasons as well. The small boats is actually a very small part of it. Um, but I think, yeah, it's the optics, isn't it? The government needs to look like they've got a, a stamp on this. Um, otherwise, anything else could set it off. And who knows, we could be sitting here in a week's time and there's more writing. Absolutely. Just, just finally, before you go, it's a really important topic. How is Sakir going to appease or try to at least offer some sort of ear to those who feel aggrieved in their own country. Because at the end of the day, those sentiments are not going anywhere. They're being pushed underground. We saw it all on display. They're not going anywhere. And forcing them to go to court is not the solution. Well, I think you do need to take them to court for, you know, people are saying, oh, you're taking your country back by stealing well, for, for putting a post on Facebook? Surely, well, yeah, surely, but, surely. OK, but the post is is suggesting to blow up a mosque with adults inside. You know, you've, you've got to Not have law and order. Them. You've got to have law and order. And that's the conservatives thing, isn't it? So you're you're blaming Sakir Starmer on, on being strict and tough on crime, which is usually what the conservatives would do. So I think Not you've, got to crime. Have, you've got to have both, haven't you? You've got to have people um, being sentenced, going to prison for crimes they commit, because you can't just charge in and and damage stores and and steal things in the name of grabbing your country back, getting your country back. But you've also got to to appease the other side and you've got to make it look like you are on the side of British people and you are listening, exactly, you're listening to their grievances. But it's quite hard to know sometimes what the grievances are when it's 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 spread by misinformation and it's quite hard to then pin pin down what's actually going on. Yeah. But I think, uh, of course, you know, the, the economy grew today by 0.6%. Things like that need to improve. The economy needs to get better. There needs to be jobs. Yeah. There needs to be higher wages. Um, Ultimately, so that that's like, really it, yeah, it is. what uh, everybody wants, it is. isn't it? Yeah. And their children to be safe, yep. of course. Really fascinating. But as you said, this is moving so fast. Who knows? Hopefully not. Next week, we'll be talking about riots. Um, but let's see how it develops over the next few days. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. As Nigeria reflects on its participation in the recently concluded Paris Olympics, critical questions have emerged regarding the return on investment and the broader economic impact of the country's performance on the global stage. While some athletes shined, analysts suggest there is room for improvement in aligning financial resources with outcomes, particularly in areas like talent development and world-class training facilities. The economic benefits of Nigeria's Olympic participation may not be immediately evident, but the potential for long-term gains, especially in national branding, could be significant. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by Abiodun Dominic Odunuga, the CEO of Bridge and Value France. Abiodun joins me from Paris. 
Abby Odin, Dominic Odunuga, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. The dust has settled. The memes are doing their rounds on social media as to be expected. I think I saw that uh, Botswana filled their national stadium to welcome home their Olympic champions. Um, how would you evaluate Nigeria's overall performance in Paris? I know you were fortunate enough to spend some time with the team there. Yeah, thank you, Juliana, for having me. Uh, I think I'll take a cue for, um, you know, the Honorable Minister of Sports Development, Senator John Eno. In his own words on social media, he said um, that the overall performance of the country falls short of objectives, expectations, and hopes. So I think it was really disappointing uh, outing. And of course, it's not news that, um, I mean, on a personal level, I felt Nigeria just came to mark attendance, right? So they call you roll call. Um, Paris Olympics 2024, Nigeria, here we are present, sir, present, man. Who could have done better? Uh, research has shown that there are many factors that would contribute to a country winning a gold medal or medals at large. And one of that is the individual talents. We do have talents, right? And this speaks to the athletes' training, dedication, effort, and experience. But the other part also has to do with the country level factor. And this speaks, for instance, to population. You know, research has also shown that the pool of potential athletes who can compete at a world-class level is bigger in countries that have a bigger population. I mean, it's part of the contributing factor. Plus 200 million people, for kind of loud, who could have done better. And also, of course, national investments. People that believe to reach their athletic potential has to do with very high-level investment into world-class facilities. The Honorable Minister mentioned that for these Olympics and Paralympics, about 12 billion was earmarked for this. And so I think on a global level, aside some individual or team effort like the Tiger Rings, you know, the female basketball team, who did break a record on a larger scale of things, I think uh, it was a poor outing and we, we should have done better. Um, Abby Odin, how do you see uh, the relationship between sports performance and national branding? I, I've just come back uh, from the States and my goodness, you couldn't walk 100 metres without seeing huge billboards of Simone Biles, um, Shikari Richardson here in the United Kingdom. Um, all of the advertisements have been about the Olympic um, champions. Clearly, it's working. Why don't we do that back home? Uh, very, very, very good question. I think on a personal level, before I even go to the national, you know, part of um, branding that helps us as a people, as a country, you know, I've traveled across the world and I, I said to some of my friends that I think as celebrities or successful athletes or sports persons have done me greater good. For instance, as far as France to Brazil, I've traveled to those part of the world and you just mentioned I'm a Nigerian and then the local person goes like, I love Gigi Okocha, do you know him? <laughs> and then friendship is born. Yeah, That's on a personal level. So you can imagine what leverage succeeding at the Olympics would have done for branding. Um, just recently, a few days ago, Financial Times had to do a report on the you know, gold medalist on Tebogo, on you know how much he's done for his country. In the same article, while they're projecting his accomplishment as a gold medalist, they still touched on Botswana's mining industry. Mm -hmm. And so the idea around leveraging on such platforms to be able to rebrand our country is, I mean, cannot be emphasized. You know, I, I was recently, you know, we got in contact, I mean, a French major media group wrote to our association in France and was asking us to talk about protest. That was on, that was about a few, I mean, a few days ago, and tell us about protest in Nigeria, bad governance. We declined the offer. I mean, when we checked it internally with my colleagues, majorly for one reason, we told the French group, right, that when we have good stories to tell, you don't give us the audience mm -hmm. about investments in Nigeria. But you tell us talk about protests and living in France for 10 years, I can tell you when it comes to protests, France should be of number course, one. they're the leaders <laughs> of the world in that. Get the, get the gold medal. I mean, just live in but, but that doesn't actually now, you know, um, you know, ignore the reality. Abby Odin, Dominic Odunuga, who is the CEO of Bridge and Value France, he wears many, many other hats. He's also an entrepreneurship consultant too the French government and the Nigerian government. Thank you so much for your time and expertise today, Bjorn.
Thank you for having me, Selena. Thank you. Coming up on Channel's Business Global, I'll be catching up with digital marketing expert and tech community leader, Peace Itimi, to explore the strategies driving success for African tech startups, from scaling in unique markets to leveraging data-driven marketing. And I'll be looking back at some of the biggest business news stories of the week. All of this after the break. Do stay with us. Welcome back to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. I'll shortly be speaking with Peace Itami, but until then, here's a breakdown of some of the biggest business news stories of the week. The UK's economy is showing promising signs of recovery, with the latest figures from the Office for National Statistics revealing a 0.6% growth in GDP for the second quarter of this year. This growth marks a significant rebound from the shallow recession at the end of 2023, driven primarily by the resilience of the services industry. However, not all sectors fared equally, with retail and real estate experiencing declines. In a significant development in the tech industry, the US Justice Department is reportedly contemplating a historic move to break up Google, following a federal judge's ruling that the tech giant illegally maintained a monopoly in online search. This decision marks the first major antitrust case against a tech company in over two decades. Discussions have turned towards remedies, with a breakup being one of the more drastic options under consideration. Sources familiar with the matter suggest that key components like Android, Chrome browser, and possibly its advertising platform AdWords could be candidates for divestiture. The Justice Department is expected to present its proposed remedies in a subsequent court session, with a hearing scheduled for early September. Following Monday night's conversation between Donald Trump and Elon Musk, industry insiders suggest that major advertisers are reportedly losing faith in X and are turning to alternative platforms like TikTok for their marketing needs. This move comes amid concerns over the management of X under Musk's leadership and the platform's ability to provide a suitable environment for brand safety and effective advertising. The shift is highlighted by a series of high-profile departures from X to TikTok as a viable alternative due to its massive user base and innovative advertising formats that resonate with younger demographics. And now to my final topic. As Africa's tech ecosystem continues to evolve, digital marketing has emerged as a critical tool for scaling startups across the continent. Industry experts highlight several key strategies that have proven effective in Africa's unique market environment, where digital transformation and the adoption of new technologies are rapidly changing the landscape. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by a digital marketing expert and tech community leader, Peace Itimi. Peace, Itimi. Thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global today. You are a digital marketing expert, so you're the best person that we can speak to on this topic. What role do you believe digital marketing plays in driving innovation within Africa's tech sector? Oh my, thank you so much, Juliana, for having me. Um, this is a sub subject I'm very excited about. I can talk about it all day, but I wouldn't do that. I, I will share a few points. <laughs> I think digital marketing plays a very vital role in driving innovation in African tech sector by enhancing visibility, customer engagement, but also market insights. I'll break it down. The first one is just market reach, right? Digital marketing really allows tech companies to reach a wider audience across multiple states, across multiple countries from one channel, right? I can post something very easily on Twitter, on internet, on my website, and anybody anywhere can get access to my product and services. And so that wider reach that you wouldn't just get if you're only advertising in one specific place on one billboard is one way that digital marketing really helps like drive innovation in, in African tech. It's also more cost effective because if we think about the amount of people you can reach online from just one channel, from your laptop in one place in the world, um, compared to having to do like a lot of uh, maybe billboard adverts or lamppost adverts or just traditional advertising across multiple locations, multiple cities, the shoe market is much more cost effective. So you find a lot of African tech startups who are leveraging digital and going online to enhance their visibility because it will cost them 90% less yeah. versus trying to do traditional advertising. There's almost no limit. You can build a global product from Lagos. You can build a global product from Kano. You can build a global product from London that's actually serving Africans. It's it's like the world is at your fingertips with digital marketing. Thank you so much um, for those tips. Really insightful. And, you know, for you, that sounds really, really easy. But I'm sure for <laughs> many of our viewers who are watching, it is so difficult, especially yeah. because 
you go on to Instagram or X or any of these platforms now, you are totally saturated yeah. um, with content. I, I think I was flipping through one of them um, just a few hours ago, and now they've got these AI <laughs> models, you know, yeah. reading scripts, which is good. But then how do you stand out um, when everybody seems to be doing the same thing? Because that appears to be some of the headwinds that a lot of tech startup founders are facing in Nigeria at the moment, as in, yeah, I've got a great idea, a really great product. The only thing is everybody's doing what I'm doing. Yeah, I mean, start, you, you're very right. Standing out in a very crowded market, very saturated, can be very difficult. But I think that's the beauty of storytelling and power storytelling. Mm. One of the things that I do is I run a platform called Founders Connect, where I tell stories of African founders and innovators. And the goal of it is to have is to give founders the opportunity to tell their stories organically and from a very real, authentic place. No matter how saturated the market is, when somebody comes across a content that is a powerful story, they actually sit and watch and pay attention, right? You might not be able to reach a million users at a time, but the 10, 50, 100 people who then see that piece of content, I was captivated by the story, that actually resonates with them and actually sticks. And they are the home people who then come to your website, use your product, and they refer other people. And that storytelling actually compounds. And that's what founders need to be able to pay attention and say, okay, I'm not trying to reach all 1 million, 2 million users at the same time. I want to find my top target audience I want to create and tell powerful stories that get to the first 5% and 10%. And then I want to delight them with fantastic products so that when they see the stories, this is great. I'm on Founders Connect or I'm doing, I, I wrote this blog at core. I made this video. You know, yes, they really loved it. They come to my website. They download my product, download my app. They then realize that they get value from it because that's another place. It's wanting to do the marketing and to actually stand out. But when you actually acquire the customers, how do you ensure that the value that you promised them in the story that they get it? When you do that, like powerful product, product-led marketing, then they stick. Then they do go back and tell more stories for you. So it's like a repo effect of say, I want to make sure that I'm telling powerful stories for the first 10. And then I have really great product. First, tell stories, right? Tell really powerful, organic, authentic stories. People connect with, this is actually the problem that I'm trying to solve. And this is why we're solving it. And this is our unique approach to why we're solving it. And do that storytelling for a niche part of your target audience. And then ensure that the product that they interface with actually works and delivers. When you layer those two things together, you're beginning to see, you begin to see like a ripple effect where they begin to refer other people. You're telling more stories, you're layering up, and eventually you're adding more things like influencer marketing, community marketing, content marketing. All of those things begin to work better because those two foundational things are actually there. Africans are still building, right? Yes, there's a lot of challenges. Yes, there's lack to um, a lot of access to capital, like people in Silicon Valley, but they are builders. And that's the key thing that I actually want people to take away when watching this, that a lot of people are still building. There's an abundance of problems. And thankfully, there are lots of people who are taking up the say, I want to solve this problem. They're building in fintech. They're building in health tech. They're building in food, right? So companies like Child Egg and Food Court are doing fantastic in food. They're doing in agri-tech as well. Um, Tri Creek is one of the fastest growing companies in Africa. Um, there are a lot of people who are building regardless of you know, the challenges that they're facing. So that's the very one key thing to actually take away that, yeah, people are actually building. But two is the fact that we still need a lot of access to capital. So I can say like the very, you know, inspirational stuff of our building, but it's really also, um, we need more access to capital. We need more infrastructure as well. And so you see founders who are finding it um, difficult to say, hey, yes, I have a great idea, I have a great product, but how do I raise money to get it to the next level as well? There's also infrastructural challenges that is restricting how much, how fast, I can actually scale from one market to another or to release multiple products as well. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, the world can pay attention to, Nigeria can pay attention to and say, hey, how can we create more access to capital um, from government, whether it's grants, whether it's pitching competitions, whether it's events, um, networking sessions that give a lot of startup founders who are already solving these hard problems more um, opportunities to say, this is the right person you should meet that can actually help you grow your business. This is the right person you can meet that can actually help, help you figure out the infrastructure or technological challenges that you're actually facing as well. And founders themselves, I think for me, it's you need to keep building 
Um, but you also need to do the work. It's not just saying, hey, I need access to capital, so let me wait for someone to give me, or um, regulatory like, regulation has to be my favor. It's also, what can we do and how do we go out there? How do we tell more of our stories? How do we make sure that we're building fantastic products? So when there's actually capital to be deployed, my product becomes one of the first ones that people look forward to because, they know, oh, this founder has been bootstrapping. They've been doing the hard work for two years. Now, when you give them a $1 million, they're able to scale 10x. You you also have to be ready and you have to go out and look for that help that we're looking for as well. Gosh, peace. Uh, your optimism is palpable and um, Thank you. really great way to end the show. Thank you for all of those insights there. Um, peace and Timmy, who is a digital marketing expert and founder of the Founders Connect platform. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Yella. It was nice speaking with you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. But as always, do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.